Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to the third prep video for this series on developing a survival game. As usual, the prep videos are optional, and feel free to skip on to the main tutorial. In this video, we'll be discussing our movement controls in relation to object-oriented programming. We'll cover our movement controls. So we'll set up our ability to move forwards, backwards, left and right, as well as turn and look up and down. We'll also set up our game so that we can determine if the player is using a controller or a keyboard and mouse. And we'll have to come back and iterate this a bit to get full functionality from what we'll do in this video. In addition, we'll set it up so the player can invert their controls. So if they want to push the stick down to look up instead of to look down, they'll have that ability. And we'll also briefly explore OOP, and just a tiny bit. And we'll come back to this topic over and over again throughout the series. And for those of you who are a little bit more expert in the topic, the reason we aren't jumping directly into everything about OOP and perfect OOP setups, which by the way, there is no such thing as a perfect OOP setup. Everyone has an opinion. As the saying goes, opinions are like, <clears throat> and they all stink. Now, the reason why we're exploring a tiny bit is because jumping straight into OOP is very confusing for novices. And so I want to give a taster first. So that said, what is OOP for our novices out there? Well, OOP is object oriented programming. That answers the question, right? Doesn't it? No, no, it really doesn't. So let's start with the basics here. What's an object? An object is an instance of a class, or in this case, a BP. Now I realize for those of you who are really new to this, that still probably makes no sense. Don't worry, I'll explain in just a moment. But you're probably also asking at this point, what's a class? A class is just a file that contains a particular set of functions or methods, data, and procedures. And an example of this, putting this all together, is you know, if you've seen the second Matrix movie, when the Oracle is talking to Neo and she says, there's a program that controls the wind and a program that controls the birds. If we actually think about this as a game design, you know, the Matrix being the game, there is a class file for the wind and a class file for birds. And a bird class file, or in this case, a blueprint, a BP for a bird, has all the functions a bird needs to operate in the game. So a function to fly, to land, to nest, to sing, to peck at things, whatever. Whatever that bird does, its functions are contained within its class file. So that's what the class is. Now the object, is the bird in the game. So if we have five birds in the game, there are five instances of one class. So why is this important? Well, we'll explore this in a little bit more depth and how this relates to our, our game design and what we're gonna do in this tutorial. And to do so, we need to explore the fundamentals of OOP. And there are four fundamentals, and those are abstraction, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Now, we're not going to talk about abstraction for a long while, so don't worry about that one quite yet. And we're not going to talk about inheritance until we get towards our inventory system, and then we'll get into what inheritance is. We're going to focus on encapsulation and polymorphism. Now I will say I am going to violate some of the rules around polymorphism in this tutorial. And I'll explain why I'll do that. And I'm gonna give you a challenge to actually engage in proper OOP design by addressing that issue. So let's start with encapsulation. Encapsulation can be summed up as like with like. In other words, a class file only cares about itself. We can think about this as saying the, found, the, the functions within the class file should only deal with that class file. There's a boundary to what they should be able to address. So if we have a bird, it only cares about itself. It only cares about bird functions. It doesn't care about anything else. And it's only allowed to address things ab around itself. So 
nesting, singing, flying. And it means that we don't have access from one class to another class. So a bird can access a tree in terms of it can't change the tree and a tree can't change a bird. However, the classes communicate with each other and we can communicate via casting, which in blueprints can cause a few issues and we'll talk about that later on, or via interfaces or um, event dispatchers and other methods. And we'll explore some of these methods throughout this series. And why do we use encapsulation? Well, encapsulation better organizes the code. It al allows for easier debugging. It makes life just easier in general, and it can prevent some bugs. Now, let's, let's take a step back and think about encapsulation again, using the example that I already have up here of the birds and the trees. I've already said that it's the classes only care about themselves. So a tree only cares about a tree and only runs tree-based functions. Grow, leaves move, things like that. But that does not mean the tree and the bird do not know about each other. They can communicate with each other. So if a bird nests in a tree, so it's running a nesting function, the bird only really cares about its own nesting function. But through an interface, through an event dispatcher, through what have you, the bird might communicate to the tree that the tree needs to run a function that affects only the tree. So for example, it might run a function that says, hey, the bird is nesting in this location, don't grow leaves there. And then we have polymorphism. And polymorphism just means taking on many shapes. So we talk about this often when we talk about objects, where one object can take on many forms. And we also do this with classes as well. We'll come back to this part of polymorphism when we get to inheritance. So don't worry about that too much. But what we can do with polymorphism as well is also have a function that can do multiple things. So for example, a function that not only moves forwards and backwards, but that moves left and right as well. Now, why is this useful? Well, Polymorphism allows us to reuse functions and code without having to rewrite it. It saves space, it saves time, it allows when we use communication via encapsulation for better access to the code. And part of this, as you'll see in the series today or in the tutorial today, is that we'll use getters and setters. Now, I know if you use blueprints before, you're probably used to pulling off someone doing a cast and then getting a, uh, um, a variable. And that's one way to do a getter, but it's not an appropriate way. You should actually be using a function to get that information and to set that information. Blueprints make it a bit easier to skip that step, but if you're ever thinking about this in terms of proper C++, and in fact, later versions of Unreal, I believe 4.24, uh, or is it 2.5, actually requires in C++ the uses of getters and setters as inline functions. Um, but in Blueprint, it's still good practice to make those functions, and we'll do so so we can practice good encapsulation. All right, so what are we doing in the series itself, or in this video itself? Well, as I mentioned, we're looking at controller versus keyboard. And you might be thinking, but Zach, UE4 already gives us a method of switching between keyboard and controller. There are already multiple nodes, and we even looked at them in the last video, and you made a comment about them. Well, Yes, they have multiple nodes to do the same functions to move forward. They have one for keyboard control, they have one for controllers. Well, first, it wouldn't be much of a tutorial if we didn't explore alternative approaches. And the alternative approach we're gonna explore is a polymorphic approach, an approach that works for both keyboards and controllers. Also, this is a tutorial, as I said, it's about exploring alternative approaches. This is meant to show you one approach that could be used. There are many others. And if you want to master this topic, I strongly advise looking up other approaches if you're not familiar with them or, or and or trying to design your own approach to this. We're also going to explore movement and 
in doing movement, as I've already mentioned earlier, I am going to violate polymorphism just slightly here. Um, so in this tutorial, we'll make two functions for basic movement, one to move forwards and backwards and one to move right and left. Now, the thing about these two functions is they're exactly the same. So you're probably going, wait, wait, Zach, why are you doing both? Why are you making two functions and violating polymorphism for all about OOP? Well, unfortunately, the simple answer to that is because it's easier to read and show in the tutorial as two separate functions than to do it as one function. And also we'll be covering inverting the access control for looking up and down. So, you know, in some games you're allowed to push the thumbstick to look up um, or push the thumbstick forward to look up, or you can reverse it and push it forward to look down. Um, and you, you have that choice if you want to invert your controls or not. Now, the way that access mapping works in Unreal Engine is that it gives a button press. So say pressing the W key, a value, and that value can be between negative one and one. So when we want to walk forward, we are giving it a axis value of one. When we want to walk backwards, what we're actually doing is giving the forward value a value of negative one. So when we press W, we give the value of one. When we press S, we get the value of negative one. Now we can use basic multiplicative properties to change these values. So we can use a float variable that is set at either one or negative one to switch our access values. So if we wanted to invert our forwards and backwards control for walking, what we would do is we would multiply our access value by negative one. So we take, when we hit W, one would then be multiplied by negative one, making it overall negative one. So walking or say hitting W ends up becoming moving backwards. And likewise, when we hit S, which is negative one, we'd multiply that by negative one, which becomes a positive one, and S becomes forward. Now, just to be very clear in this series or in this video, we aren't gonna be changing our forwards and backwards when we change our um, axis, when we invert our axes. We're gonna only do that for looking up and down. You can apply it to other areas if you want, all you have to do is add in that multiplication step that you'll see in the tutorial. I want to point out there are alternative approaches to everything I am doing throughout this series. The series is meant to teach ideas and I'm trying to do as good OOP design as I can while being as clear as I can. And sometimes I'm gonna sacrifice good OOP design for clarity. Sometimes I'm gonna use one approach over another just because I'm more comfortable with it. Sometimes I'm gonna use one approach over another just because it reads better in a tutorial and is easier to explain. So for example, in today's tutorial, you'll see me use branches and branches are just if then nodes. So, if X, then do A, or if Y, then do B. An alternative to a branch is the select node. Now, you can't always use a select node as an alternative to a branch, and you can't always use a branch as an alternative to a select node. In many cases, you can, but not in all cases. Either way, though, the branch and select node have the same outcome. Now, in some cases, using one over another can make the code easier to follow and the invent graph easier to read. So you do have that choice. Now, all of this said, I'm gonna do something I haven't done since the very start of the RTS tutorial series when I began on YouTube. I am going to give you some challenges to do. And this is just like in section one of the RTS tutorial series. They're meant to help you learn and explore alternative approaches. If you are a beginner with UE4, I strongly, strongly recommend one, watching and following the tutorial exactly as, of I, as I have done it. Don't change names, don't vary, just take notes, you know, look at, what the code is doing and ask questions and write those questions down and experiment once you've followed it. Once you've copied it as is, experiment and see what happens. Or 
as I'm about to say, you know, follow it as it is and then try these challenges. If you're a bit more experienced, feel free to jump straight into the challenges. And my first challenge, and this is based on that idea of polymorphism and good OOP design, instead of using two move functions or two functions for forward movement and moving right, create a polymorphic function that does both. Or as you'll work out during the tutorial, set up the code just a little bit differently so you can use the same function in both areas. And the second challenge, a little bit more of a general challenge, is to explore an alternative, the one I just mentioned, of using branches, um, or sorry, instead of using branches, using the switch statements where possible, or using a combination of both in different areas. I don't mean go off a branch into a switch. I mean, if you have a branch and a switch, that would, or if you have multiple branches in one statement, using a switch in one place and a branch in another. All right, all of that said, the video is available. You'll find it on the playlist directly after this one. This series has been brought to you by my Patreon sponsors like Random Number Generator. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in the tutorial, and I hope that you have a wonderful day.